Good morning. Thanks for coming to uh, this lecture this morning. This is uh, the fourth talk in our series called Beyond Diffusion, the Science of Science Education. And I'm Scott Wing. I'm chair of the Senate of Scientists this year. And we are uh, co-organizing this with the office of the NMNH Office of Education and Outreach. Um, and it's really been a terrific series so far. And we're very excited about the one today. And I'm going to let Bill Watson uh, do the um, introductions for today's speaker. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Scott. I'm, I'm Bill Watson, Chief of On-Site Learning at uh, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Uh, on behalf of Sherry Word, Director of Education, Michael Mason, Director of Exhibits, and Scott, the Chair of the Center of Science, I too would like to welcome you to the fourth uh, lecture in our five lecture series, Beyond Diffusion, the Science of Science Education. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the museum's director, Christian Samper, for his vision in supporting this series and supplying the seed funding so that we could pursue it. One word of logistics before we begin. Uh, as in the last three lectures, our presenter will speak for about 45 minutes to an hour, uh, after which we'll have about 30 minutes for questions and answers. At noon, we'll conclude, and anyone who'd like to join our speaker for lunch uh, can, can just uh, sort of meet here at the podium uh, after, the, uh, after the session and we'll go down to lunch together. So this series arose from a series of conversations that Shari, Michael, and I had with the leadership of the Senate of Scientists, including then chair and now associate director for research and collections, John Coddington, and current chair, Scott Wing. When the series was conceived, John articulated the reasons for it and the Senate's vision for sponsoring it very succinctly, and I'd like to share some of those words with you uh, by way of orienting you to today's presentation. This is uh, John. Our idea is to invite the best in the field of science education as speakers in a series of lectures. In general, the purpose is to introduce Smithsonian scholars who basically live and die by their ability to formulate and test hypotheses with data to whatever the analog to that process is in the realm of education and exhibits. So I'd like to add that an important feature of this series uh, for all of us is to provoke thoughtful and inquisitive conversations about our work as scientists, educators, and researchers, and how we can work together toward the shared goals of the museum. In the first uh, three lectures in the series, Bruce McFadden, Martin Storksteek, and Philip Bell sparked exactly those kinds of conversations uh, about museums' understanding of evolution, how the field of science education views learning and meaning making in, in museums, uh, and a little bit deeper dive in Phil's uh, presentation about how people uh, begin to understand how people learn across contexts. So today's uh, topic takes those ideas a step further to consider uh, in our context and in informal settings, who is the public and how do we serve them best? So our speaker today, John Falk, is one of the field's foremost leaders in studying lear learning in informal and free choice settings. He is C. Grant Professor of Free Choice Learning in the Department of Science and Mathematics Education at Oregon State University in Portland. Before going to OSU, he's founded and directed the Institute for Learning Innovation, where for 20 years he oversaw more than 200 consulting projects ac across a wide range of free choice learning institutions, including many of the Smithsonian museums. Dr. Falk has authored over 100 scholarly articles and chapters in the areas of learning, biology, and education, and helped to create several nationally important out-of-school education curricula. His most recent book is Identity and the Museum Visitor Experience. Uh, which he published in 2009. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, or just starting to get familiar with the uh, literature in uh, informal science education, informal education and free choice settings, you know that it is uh, peppered with uh, references to John's work. And so he really is um, one of the foremost leaders in this field. And so for that uh, reason, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. John Falk. Okay, so 
it's great to be here. Uh, it's, it's truly a pleasure. Um, many, many, many moons ago, I worked for the Smithsonian. Um, and then for many of those 20 years when I was with the Institute for Learning Innovation, I was involved with a lot of projects, particularly at this museum. So this museum is sort of uh, a very special place in, place in my heart for this. Um, it's actually a pleasure to see there are a lot of friends and uh, associates from over the years here, as well as obviously a lot of new people. And it's, again, a pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to talk about today is this whole notion of who is the public, and particularly talk about some of the ideas that I've been developing over the last 10 years or so to look at that question through the lens of identity. And we'll talk more about that, you know, all of those things in a second. So um, let's start with some first principles if we're going to talk about this topic. Um, there is no such thing as the public. You know, we talk about the public as if it's some um, understandable whole, but in fact it's not. It's collections of visitors. The question is, how do you begin to understand those collections of visitors in order to make sense of them? You know, the good news is we would like to believe, and in fact it's true, that each one of those visitors is a unique individual. If an institution like this really set its mind to it, um, at some point down the road, it would be great to think that we could deal with each of those individuals as individuals. But you know, five million individuals a year, and that's just the physical <coughs> folks who show up, let alone the virtual folks. You know, so we're talking about tens of millions of people um, dealing with those individuals at the moment. That's really challenging. Um, but if we really want to understand something about those visitors, those collections of visitors, we cannot really understand them if we begin in our shoes, um, which is, to be honest, the way often we've thought about this. You know, here we are, the Natural History Museum, or whatever kind of museum we are. Here's what we do. Obviously, people are coming to see us, so that's how we can begin to understand these people by talking about why they come to see us, um, in terms of as if what we are saying and what we do is of utmost importance. Actually, it's not. People come to fulfill their own needs. They have their own reasons for coming here, which may or may not have anything to do with who you are and why you think you're here. And if we really want to understand something about our visitors, uh, broadly defined, we actually need to start from their perspective, not from our perspective. <coughs> Those are just sort of baseline ideas here. So let's talk about this. Um, most efforts to think about and understand the nature of the museum visitor experience has begun and ended inside the four walls of the institution. I will tell you that most of the research, you know, I've been doing this kind of stuff for over 30 years. <coughs> and for most of my career, I too um, assumed that the logical way to understand something about visitors to a place like the Natural History Museum would be stand inside the Natural History Museum and see who comes, what they do. I will tell you that that's problematic. Um, also, most efforts to think about how do you define visitors and how do you begin to um, organize visitors in a coherent way has typically been defined by permanent characteristics of either the museum, so this is a natural history museum, so obviously visitors must have something to do with natural history, or it's an art museum, and therefore people who come must have something to do with art. Um, or the kinds of exhibits, it's an interactive exhibit, or it's a, non, you know, it's a static exhibit. Or we've talked about characteristics of the visitor, but usually these very fixed and permanent characteristics of the visitors, um, traditionally things like demographics, age, race, ethnicity, or even social group. Uh, you know, there are family groups. We have family visitors, um, uh, and we have adult visitors, or we have people who come in groups. And we've thought that somehow this is going to help us understand our visitors. That's really, um, as I've discovered, is not a very useful. Um, I'll give you a very personal example. Okay, um, I am these days um, over the age of 60. So I am a 60-year-old white male. Um, let's pretend I show up at your museum. What does that tell you about why I'm at the museum? What I'm interested in looking at? What I'm going to do? What I'm going to learn? Does that tell you anything? I don't think so. 
And what if I show up the next day? I'm still the same 60-year-old white male. Am I going to experience that museum in exactly the same way? Just because of my demographics? I don't think so. And so what we need to do is break out of these 20th century models of how we've defined and organized the world and come up with some new models. At least that's what I've been trying to do and would argue that we need to do. And I'm going to give you some specific data to see um, if, to help explain this. And, I, and just out of curiosity, my eyesight is not the best, but if I, can, if I stand back here, I can actually read those numbers. OK, that's good. <laughs> so we can talk about those numbers. So this is data. This is from a uh, random telephone survey that I conducted in 2009 in the city of Los Angeles looking at visitors to the California Science Center. First of all, what blew me away was that 40% um, of all the residents of Los Angeles, adult residents, have visited the California Science Center in the last eight, 10 years. That's a huge number. Um, so we can look at um, these demographics and say, OK, well, 55% of, of LA hasn't visited the Science Center, 45% has. What's the difference between those two groups? Well, it's clearly not age. Uh, this is roughly 1,000 people. So in, in the grand realm of statistics, with a random sample of 1,000, it's supposedly plus or minus 3% is um, considered to be uh, statistically significant, if you believe that stuff, which I'm not sure I do. But at any rate, um, OK, so it's clearly not age. Um, well, clearly there's a difference in terms of males and females, right? Because uh, females, 56% of uh, females were going to the Science Center versus only 44% males. But if you see those numbers totally mirror the numbers in the sample. So all that means is that if you're male, you know, it's as likely um, to go to the Science Center as not to go to the Science Center if you're male or female. What about race ethnicity? We've always assumed that, you know, obviously white people go to museums and not white people don't. Well, this data doesn't support that. At least in Los Angeles, um, the probability white versus black of going to that museum or, or brown um, going to that museum is totally comparable. Um, well, education. Education is, is, is the great predictor. No, education isn't. So although, yes, it is true that if you have a bachelor's degree, you are slightly more likely to go. This is a bachelor's degree or higher, you're slightly more likely to go to the museum than not. But you know that's not a huge difference. Um, basically, it doesn't matter whether you have a high school education or a college education, you're almost as likely to go to a place like the California Science Center as not. The one area that <coughs> demographics does tell us something about is income. This is a big difference, and this is significant. Um, Basically, the median income is roughly $50,000. If you fall below that median income, you are significantly less likely to visit the Science Center than uh, someone with the median income or greater. Um, as it turns out, the single best predictor of who visited the Science Center was participation in uh, leisure time free choice learning experiences. If you went to the library in your leisure time, you were significantly more likely to visit the Science Center. If you read the newspaper in your leisure time, you were significantly more likely to go to the Science Center. If you went on family trips, you were significantly more likely to go to the Science Center than not. Um, if you read books, you were significantly more likely to go to the Science Center than not. And that is also correlated with income. Because basically, if you're below the poverty level, leisure is not one of the things you got a lot of. Or if you do have leisure, you've got other concerns. Um, but I put this data up here to suggest that our traditional notions of demographics are somewhat um, misplaced. So the important thing to appreciate is that the museum experience is not bounded in time and space by the museum, but extends in space and time beyond the four walls. Museum. People are thinking about making decisions to come to a place like the Natural History Museum 
um, days, weeks, months, maybe years before they actually arrive. And hopefully, what happens here is an experience that continues days, weeks, months, and years after they leave. And so we need to think about that in that entirety. In fact, what we need to appreciate is that these institutions we call museums are a little piece of a person's life. And as they move through that space, the question is, does anything happen? You know? So if you think about it as a trajectory, you know, a bullet moving through an apple or something like this, um, what happens is it moves through that apple. Is it just go through with nothing happening, or does it deflect that trajectory in some way? That's actually what we want to hope, is that something happens um, besides the fact that they just pass through here. And so, in a sense, we need to think about this as an ephemeral experience, as a, an event that is a relationship between an individual and an institution, which occurs over time. And we need to understand what that event looks like in order to make sense of it. So, what my research has shown is that, at least what I think currently is the best way to make sense of this, and others can argue with this, and there probably are other ways to think of it, but I have found this concept of identity to be a useful construct as a way to make sense of this, and I'm, I'm gonna unpack this in a second, because the truth of the matter is, identity is a very slippery construct. Everybody talks about identity, but actually, if you really push on all the people who are talking about identity, the probability is they're not talking about it in the same way. We all have a sense of identity. We all have a sort of a common sense notion of what identity, that's who I am, right? But it turns out that it's a complex and multi-dimensional multi construct. And there are lots of ways to begin to this, but this is a way that I've begun to feel is useful. Um, at the very least, there is this sort of individual to collective identity. Uh, very, very bright man um, named William James, who was one of the founders of the field of psychology, wrote over 100 years ago, in the uh, end of the 19th century, he wrote a book, a treatise on psychology. And at that time, he talked about the nature of identity as a construct. And he said that all of us have, and he called what was called the I identity and the me identity. The I identity is who I think I am and how I define myself um, as uh, somebody. The me identity is how others think of who I am and how they define who I am. And there's always this tension between the identity that I think I am as well as the identity that I get reflected back from you, that you think you are. And that's, that's a negotiation. So I may think that I'm right, but if everybody out there thinks I'm stupid, at some point I might wonder whether maybe I'm as right as I think I am. On the other hand, if I think of myself as stupid and everybody keeps reflecting back, God, that guy's brilliant, I may have to reassess my own sense of who I am. Um, so there's always that tension. Um, I've made the distinction between what I call little I identity and big I identity. Most of the research, most of the social science research over 100 years worth on identity is focused on what I call big I identity. And it goes back to all those demographic categories. It goes back to uh, my identity is that I'm a male, my identity is that I'm American, my identity is that I'm white, uh, my identity is my religion, my identity is where I live. And those very fixed demographic categories, of what, again, what I'm calling these big I identities. And yes, those are important, but it turns out all of us have not a single identity, but actually multiple identities. Who we are depends on where we are and what we're doing. And on different days, we express, the, you know, the, the jargon is an act. We enact different identities at different times, depending on our needs and situations. So at the moment, um, all of you have one identity, and I have a different identity. My identity at the moment is I'm a speaker. Your identity at the moment is you're an audience. And, and it, tomorrow, those identities could be reversed. You could be the speaker, and I could be the audience. Um, that's not a fixed quality of whether I'm a white male. It just has, happens to do with the situation. 
And because today I'm a speaker, there are ways that I behave and there are ways that I interact with you which are different than if I was an audience. And we've learned those from our culture and our society. I would argue that most of our lives are spent dealing with these things I call little I identities. Being a speaker is a little I identity for me. If you sat me down uh, at some point, not today, not at this moment, but at some point and said, I want you to tell me who you are, John. Write a list. Tell me how you identify yourself. What makes you you? I don't think speaker would be very high on that list. That wouldn't be how I self-identify myself. But I will tell you right this moment, speaker is really, really high on that list. That's who I am right this moment. And so we are always defined in part by the situations. When we wake up in the morning, we don't think of ourselves as a male or a female or whatever. You know, we, you know we're, we're waking up in the morning. We've got to put our feet on the ground. We have to go to the bathroom. We have to do all the things we have to do. And that's not about a race or a gender or identity, you know, nationality. Those are other issues. Um, so, as it turns out, I would argue that most of the people who go to most museums are not thinking about these big eye identities. They're thinking about little eye identities. Um, I'm a parent. I'm on vacation. I'm a tourist. Um, I'm here because I'm curious. And I'm going to talk about all those in a second. And then finally, this is a little bit of jargon, situational affordances, but what that really means is that the settings that we're in actually constrain the identities that are available to us. So we can't be all the people, we can't be all the things we want to be in every place that we are. So I may think of myself as a rugged outdoorsman and rock climber, but right here in this room, that's not an identity that has a lot of traction for me. Um, at the moment, this context has defined most of you as an audience. And son of a gun, without being told, you all realize that you're supposed to come in, take a seat, face forward, and when people start talking, you're supposed to be quiet. Nobody had to tell you that. But that's because socially and culturally, you've learned that in this context, in this setting, that's an appropriate way to behave. And you assume the identity of an audience. Um, Museums, as it turns out, also have affordances. And the public thinks of museums as places to go to do a certain amount of things. And there are a whole lot of other possible things that you could do in those settings, identities that you could have, but the museum doesn't afford, allow you, to think that that's an appropriate thing to do there. So, um, although you could do rock climbing in the Natural History Museum, functionally, it's not considered to be appropriate behavior to do here. And most people wouldn't even think that that's why they should come here, let alone when they come here, that's what they should do. But in theory, that's possible, right? So the settings constrain what we want. And so identity at any given moment is the interaction of all these things. Who I think I am, who I, how others reflect upon me, what those various possible identities would be that I want to express, and what the situation constrains me to think about. So with that as background, let's talk about visitor identity related motivation. I would argue that most visitors come to a place like a museum in order to express some identity. Those identities can be made visible, since it's sort of hard to get inside people's heads, through the descriptions they give about why they're there, what their expectations are, what their motivations for visiting the museum are. And the, it turns out that these identity-related reasons, um, it is my research suggests, are fairly robust ways to make sense of people. Remember I said we can't deal with millions of people, but actually if we want to divide them up in some reasonable way, it turns out we can divide them up based on their identity-related needs. And their identity-related needs turn out to be constrained by, again, in jargon, the affordances, by what people perceive that museums like this allow you to do. Why would I go to the museum? Well, I can give you hundreds of reasons, but they all tend to fall within a relatively small number of reasons. 
In fact, for the vast majority of reasons, these identity-related motivations come in five flavors. What I have called explorers, facilitators, experience seekers, professionals, hobbyists, and what I used to call um, spiritual pilgrims, but I got a lot of flack from my foreign colleagues. That was not a phrase that's had a lot of um, resonance outside the United States, so I backed off and called them rechargers. And I'm going to explain what each of these characteristics are like, and I'm going to guess. And actually, what I'm, what I'm going to wager is that each and every one of you, at some point, has been each of these five people, even though you're the same person. But on a different day, for a different reason, you can be each of these. So, a lot of visitors come because they're curious. They don't, they come, and I'm going to use this museum as an example, but you can fill in the blank and, and define it by whatever museum you're at. Um, they're motivated by their curiosity. So they come to the Natural History Museum and you say, what you, why are you here? And you say, well, I, you know, I love this kind of stuff. Did you come to see anything in particular? No. Um, but I'll know it when I see it. Um, they didn't wake up and say, God, I, I, I've got to answer this burning question. I'm just generally interested in this stuff, and that's why I've come. There are a lot of people who come um, because they're here for others. Why are you here today? Because my son is crazy about dinosaurs. Do you like dinosaurs? Yeah, yeah dinosaurs. Okay. But I'm here because my son really loves dinosaurs. Or Aunt Martha just loves rocks and minerals, and she's visiting from out of town. So I thought this would be a great place to bring Aunt Martha um, so that she could you know, prove out other rocks and minerals. Do you like rocks and minerals? I could care less about rocks and minerals. <laughs> but Aunt Martha loves them, and my satisfaction is derived by making Aunt Martha happy. Um, it turns out not a lot of institutions, but this institution gets a lot of people who come because it's the thing to do. So why are you here while I'm in Washington? And you know, while I'm in Washington, I have to go to the Smithsonian, I have to see the Capitol, and I have to see uh, the Washington Monument, all in one day. Um, so it's the thing to do, because um, it's supposed to, you know, I, I understand that if I'm in Washington, this is what I should do. Because when I go home, and I tell people that I'm in Washington, if, and they say, well, did you see the Hope Diamond? And if I didn't say I saw the Hope Diamond, and they say, well, you didn't go to Washington and you didn't see the Hope Diamond. So, you know, I come and I've got this thing that I have to check off and basically say, okay, you know, I've, I've been here, done that. Um, there are people who are professionals or hobbyists who go to these institutions because they have specific interests, because they are like Aunt Martha. They really do like rocks and minerals. And Aunt Martha is going to spend most of her visit in the Geology Gems and Minerals Hall, even though she might cruise around the other part. But if she's here for two hours, she's going to want to spend one hour in GGM. That's what she's going to, that's because that's her interest. And in fact, most of the people here are probably um, museum professionals of one help or another. So how many of you, when you go to a different city, visit the museum? You guys are going because you're professionals and hobbyists, because even if you're curious about it, you know, Somewhere in the back of your mind, you're thinking, gee, I wonder how they do this stuff. This is really interesting. And sort of collecting ideas that you might be able to use in your own institution. And then finally, there are people who come just to get away, just to chill, or maybe because of the awe and want to be inspired. And they say, I come to these places because they're inspiring. Now, you know, in the middle of a busy spring day, it's sort of hard to feel rejuvenated um, in this place. But there are people who come in the winter, they come in off-peak hours where they can be by themselves and they can just commune with, with the exhibits or maybe just sit and enjoy the quiet space and be out of traffic. Um, and for the first time in public, I'm going to say, actually I'm going to talk about two additional identities. Now these five represent the vast majority of people who come to places like National History Museums, zoos, aquariums, art museums, history museums, of most kinds, um, uh, national parks, um, science centers. But there are other kinds of institutions, and people have other identities for going there. So for example, there are people who go to places like the Holocaust Museum or the Af African American Museum, 
we will go to the new African American Museum here because of big eye identity. You know, this is who I am. I want to come here and feel a relationship to this and learn more about my big eye identity, myself as an African American, myself <coughs> as a Jew or whatever. Um, it's my heritage. And that happens. Um, not very often in a natural history museum. Um, there are also people who go to sites um, for lack of a better name, that respectful pilgrim, because they want to honor the memory. That, this is actually the Vietnam Memorial. There are people who are coming to the Vietnam Memorial because they feel a sense of duty and obligation and respect. Um, when the um, new 9-11 museum gets built in New York, um, that will be a site that people will go and in very quiet tones, not tell people to be quiet, they'll, they'll just walk into that place and have a sense of respect and they will feel that they need to be there, um, their duty now to be there. And again, they will be of all ages, of all races, of all ethnicities, uh, and all nationalities, but they will feel the need to go to that place and have uh, a certain sense of reverence. So in a sense, the setting itself will help define not who comes, but why people come. And that's, that's really the important point. So just to backfill a little. OK, so I've given you this big <coughs> idea. The big idea is I think we can classify people, as it were, on the basis of their identity-related needs for going to an institution turns out, despite the fact there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, and millions of reasons why people would come to a place like a National History Museum, they end up falling into just a few basic categories, basic reasons. The reasons for this turn out to be not so much defined by the National History Museum, but defined by our society and our culture that says that these are good places to go for these reasons. How did I get there? Well, how I originally got there is I, was, I had a very large NSF grant, thank you, the National Science Foundation. <laughs> and, um, and in that first NSF grant, I basically, with a colleague, actually Martin Storsky, uh, was my research assistant on that project. Um, we basically randomly looked at 200 visitors to one major exhibition at the California Science Center and we try to understand why they're there, what they do, and what they learn. We got additional funding from NSF to try and track down, and we did. Um, two years later, uh, a quarter of that sample, and we spent um, two to three hours interviewing 50 people in their homes about the visit that they made to the California Science Center two years prior, to try and see what sense did these folks make of it. And in the process, the sense that I made out of the sense that they made was that, you know, there were some patterns here. And that pattern seemed to relate to why they came in the first place. Their memories of what they remembered and how they talked about the experience was related to not so much what they saw as why they came. But of course, what they saw and what they did was related to why they came. And that had an effect on memory. Anyway, that was a hypothesis. So then with additional funding from the National Science Foundation, um, this time using zoos and aquariums, some other colleagues and I um, looked at over 5,500 people at 12 different zoos and aquariums across the United States and basically tested this hypothesis that actually you could segment visitors on the basis of their, their identity-related motivations. And those identity-related motivations would actually be, in some way, informing <coughs> your, our understanding of what they did and what they learned. And then following up from that, I now have corroborating research that comes from more than a dozen different institutions in a number of different countries um, and thousands more visitors, which seem to support this basic model. So in a sense, I'd like to believe that there is an empirical basis for these statements that I made. So what does this look like? So let's get down to some specifics. So people come to the museum. And we want to understand why they're there. But of course, most of what's going on between that person and that museum is not available to us. We can't 
quiet inside people's heads. Um, we can try as best we can, but we're always using sort of partial information to make inferences about what's going on. So that's just background. Um, and clearly, the visit is shaped by what they see, what they bump into, what their interests are, what their, you know, literally the exhibits they encounter, the objects they see. They may not have been expecting to bump into X, but they bump into X, and wow, that's really cool. But what's also interesting is that it, this, I, these identity-related motivations tend to form a basic trajectory through the experience. So let me give you a concrete example of this. So if I come to this museum as an explorer, say, which says I'm just curious, okay, and I will know it when I see it. My curiosity, though, so what I'm looking for is something that will pique my curiosity. And so I may just sort of wander around, but at some point I'll find something that I find really interesting. And what is it that I'm likely to find really interesting? What I'm likely to find really interesting is the laws of probability would say that it's something that I already know something about a little bit, something that I'm already interested in. And so, again, going back to Aunt Martha, Aunt Martha is far more likely to find something interesting in GGM than she is to find something interesting in the Africa Hall. Not ever particularly interested in, in cultural anthropology, but she's very interested in rocks and minerals. And even though she doesn't know what's in the museum, the fact that she is wandering around this, this geology, gems, and minerals hall increases the probability she'll bump into something that stimulates her interest and her curiosity. So then what she'll do is say, well, that was really interesting. On the other hand, if I'm uh, an experience seeker, I probably, I'm not coming here to tabula rasa. I know that there's some things I'm supposed to see. I'm supposed to see the whole time. I'm supposed to see the dinosaur. I'm supposed to see the insect zoo. And so it's by no mistake that somehow I end up visiting the insect zoo, the dinosaur hall, and um, go see the Hope Diamond. Those are things that fulfilled my expectations of what a visit to this place should afford. Now, I may bump into other things that I hadn't expected, and those may be cool too, but my visit will not have been complete if I didn't see those things that I expected to see before I came. But what's really interesting, though, is if we then talk to people about what they remember, of course, those memories are shaped by what people see and do. I mean, what else would the memories be shaped by? But, and they also are shaped by things that happen afterwards. But, if I come with expectations, which defines the trajectory of my visit, if I came to see the whole time, I'm likely to walk away remembering, wow, I saw the whole time. That was really cool. And so two years later, when I talk to you about what did you remember about your visit to the Natural History Museum, a lot of things will fall in the way, but I'll still remember the Pope Diamond because that's what I was supposed to see, and that's what I did see, and so that was really salient for me. Um, let me give you another example. This is a zoo and aquarium example. Um, so six months, five months, after a visit um, to a zoo, talked to two visitors, both adults, about their visit. And obviously I'm somewhat paraphrasing what they said, but these are based on actual transcripts. So tell me about your visit to the zoo. Oh, it was a great gorilla day for Billy. Um, we, had a, we had a really wonderful time at the zoo, but Billy loves gorillas, and he saw the gorilla, and he was so excited about it. We talked about it all the way home, um, and then proceeds to talk about that. What about your visit? Oh, it was great. Billy had, a, you know, Billy was had, you know, we, we had really a lot of fun on the slides and the train. And then I mentioned the gorillas. Yeah, he had a great time with the gorillas. So, what kind of visitor is this? Facilitator. So their experience revolved around Billy. And they, weeks, months, years later, would be hard pressed to tell you what they saw or thought about, but they could tell you all about what Billy or whoever their, their significant other was. They could remember what they did and what they learned and what they got excited about. And I'll explain that in a second. Okay, another visit. Um, so tell me about your visit. Oh, I thought it was amazing. I was eye to eye with this girl. 
We were staring at each other, face to face. I mean, I, it was amazing. I was looking in the eyes. And I, it was like I, he was reading my mind and I was reading his mind. But what about Sarah? Weren't you but there with your daughter? Oh, Sarah had a great time. But have it, but that for real life. So, and what kind of visitor would that be? Probably explorer or something like that. Yeah. They're both family visitors. You know, demographically, they were the same. But their experiences were entirely different because they were ultimately there for a different reason. And what they remembered and what was salient for them was different. And that's what this stuff here means. So what, what we remember is what is both emotionally salient. Emotion plays very strongly in our memories. Obviously, we can only remember what we see. But what we see and experience is filtered through those emotions. And those are filtered ultimately, I would argue, um, not totally, but largely influenced by these identity-related motivations. So whereas that first example I gave you, if I'm there as a facilitator, I'm looking for opportunities to experience this through my child. I'm there to be a good parent. And what then is salient for me is when I feel like I am a good parent. And so if Billy gets excited about the gorillas and Billy talks about the gorillas, then for me, that's a, emotionally a very, very salient experience. Because that reinforced for me that I'm a good parent. I did the right thing. And so that's what I'll remember. If I'm there as a explorer, for example, and I'm looking for something that will you know, make my heart spin, and I discover something and have this really peak experience, that's what I'll remember. So for example, when we talked to these visitors in the California Science Center two years later, there were some people who were there as a family group, but they were there as explorers, who frankly, two years later, couldn't even remember who they had been at the museum with or if they were there with anybody. It's because that wasn't important for them. That wasn't why they were there. They may they, have used, but if you'd ask them as they walked in the door, superficially, why are you here? Oh, I'm here for my child. But that's not really why they were there. And so, from that same California Science Center data. And this is why we can't, if we want to understand something about our visitors, if we only look inside the box, we don't get a very accurate picture. So this, and in a sense, the details are unimportant. What's important is the gestalt. So this is a measure of learning about biology as a function of this exhibit at the California Science Center, which is about biology. This is as they walked in the door. Um, we gave them a free test on their knowledge of biology. Here's as they walked out the door, a, a post-test on their knowledge of biology. OK, purple are facilitators, green are explorers. There's no difference there, right? Two years later, so this is not linear. Two years later, there is a difference. Basically, even though in the short term, those facilitators picked up a bunch of facts and concepts, and their knowledge of that biology changed, two years later, they're essentially back down to baseline because they weren't there to learn about biology. Whereas the explorers were actually there to learn about biology. And because of that, two years later, the stuff they learned, they retained because it was important to them. So it's not as if that first, that gorilla person who was the explorer if I talked to them as they're walking out the door, couldn't have told me who they were there with. Two years later, though, they may not remember who they were there with because it wasn't salient. And you know, this is the bottom line is what do we care about what people seem to know as they're walking out the door? Who cares what they know when they're walking out the door? What we care about is what they know months and years later. If we're going to have an impact, that's an impact. The short term stuff, which is where virtually 90% Eight percent of all the research that's been done on quote unquote learning in places like museums has been done inside the box. And if we stick with the box, well, we can feel like we accomplished a lot. But in fact, maybe we didn't accomplish as much as we thought, but maybe we accomplished more. But the only way we do it, know that, is if we could meaningfully separate those two groups. Because if we combine them together, the mean might not be significant. But that's the way we've dealt with this. We've dealt with public as if it's the public. 
And our measures of learning in places like this have historically just looked at the public. But that doesn't help us understand what's really going on with the public. When we looked at the zoo and aquarium data, for example, um, this was a sample. The ultimate study we did was with four institutions, um, two zoos, two aquariums. If we looked at it as a sample of a couple thousand people, there was no evidence that there was any change in learning between pre and post. However, if we segmented them into these categories, Lo and behold, we discovered that some learned and some didn't. Because they were there for different reasons, different, they had different motivations, and different parts of that experience were relevant to them or not relevant to them. So, this is basically what I've been saying. The majority of all visitors come to settings like this for one of, by and large, five identity-related reasons. And looking through that lens allows us to have an ability to qualitatively understand something about what people do and what they take away from them, this experience. Now, what I want to say too is that I think that this model, if I'm lucky, will explain what 70% of the people do 70% of the time. Do the math. That's about 0.49, right? <laughs> so at best, what I'm hoping is that this might be predictive of roughly half our visitors. On the other hand, given where we've been, being able to predict nothing about any of our visitors, <laughs> being able to make some qualitative predictions about our visitors is pretty good. And when I say qualitative, the specifics are going to be a function of each individual. But facilitators, for example, the nature of their memories and the nature of what they learn is going to be qualitatively similar to other facilitators and qualitatively different between a facilitator and an explorer or between an explorer and an experience seeker. And therefore, it provides us some initial tools for making better sense of what's going on. So bringing this all home, but well, not yet, um, here's just some data so you get a sense of uh, what <coughs> distributions might look like. So this is the California Science Center. And as I say, you know, this is great. I was able to slot people, 90% of the people into a category, but there's still 10% I couldn't. Um, New York Aquarium, actually, this was an earlier generation tool. Um, so I'd like to believe that my tool got better, which is why I got better at being able to slot people in. But still, um, two thirds of the people I could slot into different categories. Um, a third I couldn't put into one of these baskets. I will tell you that 90% of these visitors, 90% of those California Science Center visitors were family groups. But to classify them as a family group didn't actually provide you much information about what they were going to be there for and what they were going to be doing. So, um, so here's some implications for privacy. So clearly, if we have a better sense of why people are coming, we should be able, in theory, to do a better job of supporting their needs. If this is really what they're here to do, well, then maybe we can really help them accomplish it. So if we know that they're really here to support the learning of their child, well, then obviously we can provide better tools. But the fact that they walk into a child doesn't mean that that's what they want to do. So they may be here to stimulate their own curiosity. So if we knew that, then we could be helpful to in fact help them ensure that their child doesn't wander away while we ensure that they get the curiosity, satisfying experience that they really want. Now, again, logistically, with five million visitors, that's challenging. Um, other institutions with smaller numbers might find that less challenging. But at any rate, in theory, that's really an important finding. Um, but it's also important to appreciate that if you think about it, if a very large percentage of what dictates what you will do and what you remember is determined by why you think you're coming in the first place, then it behooves us to think about extending 
our concept of the influence we have on the experience beyond, again, the space of the institution. We need to be proactive in helping people think about what they can do here and how they can use that information later. Uh, I made a comment before this talk, which uh, really resonated with Bill. You know, if you're worried about this institution and the visitor experience here, I would argue probably what you're doing inside the box for those five million plus visitors is fine. What you, but what you're not doing for those five million visitors before they arrive and after they leave is not fine. If you want to really make a difference in the lives of your visitors, then you need to redefine what your goals are here and how you can influence them. Because again, that experience transcends that couple hours they spend in your box. You need to think about why they're coming and how you can influence that and um, prepare them for a better experience. And then you need to reinforce and support that experience after they leave. That's where the action can and probably should be over the next decade. And then finally, what's important to emphasize about this is this is not about creating different exhibits and programs. It's about creating different visitor experiences. It's not about thinking about this box, this experience, as a fixed entity, and your visitors as a fixed entity. It is an interaction that occurs uniquely each time somebody walks into this space. And so I can walk into this museum today with my child, and I have needs that need to be met in terms of being a facilitator. I can come tomorrow by myself and I have different needs. Same building, same exhibits, but the experiences that I require and what will determine for me whether it's a quality experience will be different. So how do we meet those needs? And how can we flexibly use the hardware we have to create better software experience? How can we add software experiences really to deal with the hardware that we have to basically ensure that our visitors have a more robust more enjoyable and more educational experience. Now, there are also some implications for research. Um, since the parts will speak about research, talk about that. I mentioned one of these things already, and that's um, at the very least, this model gives us a way to begin to segment our visitors so that we can reduce the variability of our samples. So, if we're dealing with all historically, if all of our data collected from the public, and we know that our public comes for different reasons and has different needs, why would we deal with that as a total sample? Actually, by training on a biologist, it would be like saying, I really want to understand something about um, leaf hoppers. Um, and the way I'll do that is I'll collect every insect here, and I'll try and figure out what all these insects are doing. What would, why would that give me a lot of information about leaf hoppers? If I'm looking at all the other insects in that community, what I need to do, if I want to look at leafhoppers and know that leafhoppers have a unique niche, then obviously I have to just sample leafhoppers and try and figure out are the, you know, what's going on in the leafhopper population. We are analogously looking at all of the insects in the community when we should be looking at leafhoppers and grasshoppers and different species of grasshoppers probably eventually. And I will tell you that in terms of this segmenting. Um, here's a little truth in advertising. Okay, the good news is I've simplified life and said that there are these five basic identities which explain large majorities of visitors. But that's a very, very gross, sort of coarse-grained first cut. Um, at the very least, most people come for multiple reasons. So you know, we could look at people who are facilitating explorers. Or are they exploring facilitators? Is that negative? I don't know. That's five factorial um, groupings, which is a large number. But now all of a sudden we're dealing with 50 or 60 categories, right? Um, and that becomes mad that becomes really problematic. But even within those categories, there are more fine grains that we can look at. But if I start saying that actually the good news is we can segment our visitors into 150 meaningful categories. All of you who are practitioners are going to say, thanks, John. That's been really good. <laughs> that doesn't help me. But you need to appreciate 
that even though this is useful to divide people into five groups, that it is rough approximations. It's, it's a very initial coarse grained way of beginning to sort things. So, okay, good. At least we're not going to be dealing with all the plants. We're going to at least focus first on trees and then shrubs and then maybe you know, something else. But at least we can make those find you know, coarse grained distinctions, which are going to help us be more informed about what's going on. So that's one thing that's going to help. The other thing is, the interesting thing is, although this helps us begin to understand the motivations of visitors, it is a mirror to how the public perceives the use, utility, value of these institutions. These are socioculturally defined categories. In other words, I didn't make this up as a visitor that I could come here to do this. It's because I live in a society that tells me these are places that satisfy these needs. And much like I didn't have to tell you folks to come in and sit down and be a good audience, you were all enculturated to know what it means to come in a place like this and to be a good audience. You could do other things in this space, but you didn't think that that was appropriate. Likewise, people come to our institutions because they perceive that this is what you're supposed to do. Now, we can sit back and say, well, isn't that interesting? Is that how I'd like my institution to be perceived? Maybe, maybe not. If it's not, what are you going to do about it? That's the public perception. If it turns out that 90% of the visitors, I don't know what the real numbers are, but if 90% of the visitors to your institution really felt that the only value of this place was to come as an experience seeker, what would that tell you about how the public perceives this institution? That's probably not what most of the people who work in this institution would like to think is the value of this institution. So in a sense, it tells us how the public is perceiving our institution, and it also tells us what that contract currently looks like. The contract is, I come to satisfy this need. If you don't satisfy that need, then you, as an institution, haven't fulfilled that contract. If you want the contract to be different, you've got to do something about it. At least this gives us some sense of what our public value is perceived to be at the moment. And then finally, um, if this notion of identity and identity building is truly important, which I would hypothesize that it is, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but let's assume for the moment, suspend this belief, and say that it is, well, we know precious little about how these institutions actually support identity. We have no measures of identity building. You know, we can measure whether somebody learned X or Y. We can measure whether they had a good time. We can measure their attitudes. But we have no measures at the moment for seeing whether their identity was reinforced and built. But if that's what's going on, maybe we need some measures to look at identity. Um, and that's an area of research. So I think that's my story. And um, we'll open this up to questions.
will not change. It wasn't so fun in the industrial age. Only a relatively small number of people perceived that going to places like museums was a worthy thing to do in your leisure time. Today, the majority of the public, regardless of their education, perceive that museums are entertaining places to go. Now, there are places that are more entertaining and less entertaining. And, you know, teenagers are a whole different species. And, you know, I, I'm not even sure that we want to use them as a model <laughs> for understanding what the rest of the humanoids on the planet are. I mean, so that's probably not the best example. But I would say the vast majority of the public below the age of 12 and the vast majority of the public above the age of 18 consider places like this to be entertaining. And they perceive that they're places where they can learn something. You notice, by the way, that none of those categories that I gave talked about learning or education. It's because everybody comes here assuming that they're going to learn something. Why else would they come? Now, I know that there are a lot of marketing studies that have been done um, in this institution where people have said, when you ask them, why are you here? Some people say I'm here to learn, and some people say I'm here to have fun. But if you really push on them, the people who are here to say that they're here to learn also hope to have fun and expect to have fun. And the people who say they're here to have fun also hope and expect that they're going to learn something. I mean, I, the, the analogy that I like to give is if you walked into a restaurant did a marketing survey of all the people in the restaurant and asked them, why are you here in the restaurant today? You would get answers like, well, um, I particularly like the menu, I like this kind of food, uh, it's convenient, the price is right, the service is good. How many people will say, because I'm hungry? <laughs> it's assumed that the reason you're in the restaurant is to eat. But if somebody's stupid enough to ask you why are you here, why would you tell them the obvious? Um, but it is obvious. People don't think that they've come to Disneyland when they show up here. Trust me. They know they're in Disney. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, on your slides that um, if we understand the proportions of visitors to the museum that are attending the museum, then we can make the Currently, I don't think there is that research. Um, in that book that I just wrote, um, I confess I was forced by the publisher to um, have half the book be a practitioner. And I sat there and did my best to explain what this would actually look like. I'm not convinced that I did a very good job. Um, there are a lot of institutions that have begun to play with these ideas. and. Um, not to do you know, the kind of research that maybe underlies this, but the very practical empirical research, what happens if we try this, what happens if we try that, you know, what seems to work. Um, there are some institutions, um, for example, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, for a couple years now, has trained all of its volunteers, uh, floor staff, using these ideas, um, so that when they walk up to people, they figured out strategies for with, within a, just one or two questions they can ask. They can get a sense of what the interests of people are, and therefore they can then help them find what they're looking for. Um, it's a very concrete example of that. Yeah. I am one of those people you just mentioned that, yeah. that after a month of the Baltimore Art with the training, you could pick out people to enhance their experience and, and your own and all and many of those factors. Equally, you The other comment I have is, what are your thoughts about the morphing of, of reality and virtual? Um, right now, we treat objects and websites as something se separate, but with mobility and uh, mobile technologies, those 15-year-olds and the 25-year-olds in the 10-year period? Yep. Uh, well, again, I'd say the short answer is I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure um, what that future looks like. Um, other than uh, it's, a, it's a rapidly evolving landscape. And um, I don't know that anybody has, it, has the answer. Um, 
again, I think that most people who come to places like this at the moment, uh, although they may find some of the technology cool, um, are not primarily coming here for technology. If they can get the technology at home, they're coming to see real things, real objects, um, the scale of things. That doesn't mean that they won't find um, that the technology enables them to see these things in new ways and to get information about them in new ways. Um, so I'm not sure that I can give you a great answer to that. Yeah, Mary? Could you give me the um, able hypothesis of you could use the notion of the different identities to explore the online audience yes, as well? Yes, absolutely. And you might see a different identity, small identity. Absolutely. I, I, I would certainly hypothesize that when people go online in a very parallel way, they have different needs. And their satisfaction will be defined by whether those needs are met. And that, um, uh, and that most of those needs are going to be those little high identities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you think that of the five Here's where uh, I, I'll basically say that, the, that yes, that dichotomy between being a facilitator and others is a, is a really big divide. But it gets complicated because virtually everybody is showing up in the social group. And so in some ways, this is a very simplistic model of the world, which is basically saying that I'm going to put you in this bucket and it largely will define your experience. So I'll, I'll give you an example. And, and this is this is a, and, and this data is really based on essentially a thought experiment in, in some of the grand traditions of, of thought experiments. Um, I was curious to know, um, well, how stable are these categories? Because you can imagine people come for multiple reasons. They might bounce around. And uh, all of these categories over the course of their visit. And maybe, you know, it's one of these things that can intuitively it seems like a great idea, but in fact it doesn't practically help you. So I, I realized as I was flying back from Los Angeles one day that I could use myself as a guinea pig. Because actually the, the day before I had visited a museum uh, with my brother and sister in law. I certainly wasn't thinking about this stuff. I was literally just being a brother and, and brother in law. Um, we visit the museum. And I tried to say, well, could I actually figure out how, what my identity was at this visit? So the first thing I did um, was on the plane, and I was trying, so I tried to write down, and as best as I could, minute by minute, everything I did in that visit. So I started in the parking lot, and I tried to imagine, minute by minute, um, you know, what I was doing. And then I went back and tried to assign an identity to each of those one minute intervals. That's just to show you what kind of nerve I am. And, um, and then I looked at what that pattern was. The first thing that emerged was um, over the course of this hour and a half, it was my sense that I had enacted each of those five identities. I come so there was, I came with my brother and sister-in-law, so they're part of my time. I was dealing with social stuff. 
I'm a curious person, so part of the time was being an explorer. Um, they wanted to visit the gift shop, I didn't want to visit the gift shop, so I figured I hadn't been to the museum in a while, so I cruised around and I was being an experience seeker. They still were in the gift shop. And so I decided, okay, I'll just sit in the corner and chill out. So I was being a charger. Um, and truly, uh, it's been years since I've been there. Um, I, you know, and, but I, you know, even though I was doing all these other things, like I'm a museum person, so there were times when I was sort of checking out how they did these various things. So in that case, I was a professional. Um, so, but when I toted it up, what I would have said was my dominant motivation, which was explore, <coughs> something on the order of three quarters of my time in that museum, was I in that one mode. And even though I bounced around, I was primarily in that mode. And the reason I bring this up is that since most of these fo folks come as part of a social group, you're going to spend time in that social group dealing with other people. You, you have to. And, and the reverse is true. Even if you're you know, super mom and you're here with your kid, you're inevitably going to see something that you find interesting. And you have this moment of conflict. Damn, I really want to look at that. <laughs> but then you remember why you're here. You make a mental note, I'll have to come back and see that another time. Um, and you go off and spend time with the child. So, so first of all, it is more complex. And this is just the first layer of simplification of that. Um, but I'm not sure that the divine, I mean, I think there, for example, I would say there's a huge difference. Um, this is a really rambling answer to your question. I'm sorry about that. Um, rechargers. Those folks are really, really different than other folks, too. Um, there are a lot of folks, and again, National History Museum is probably not a place where you get a huge number of those, but if you, you know, go across the, across the way over to the National Gallery, there are a large chunk of folks for the National Gallery who would be rechargers. And they don't really care if they read the labels. They don't really care, even necessarily, if they walk away seeing a great painting. It is just about being in that space and sort of decompressing that's important to them. And that's very different than being a facilitator, and it's very different from being an explorer, um, for example. Professional hobbyists are really different, too. And, and I, actually, these are unique. Professional hobbyists, I've come here because I have a goal. Because actually, there are professional hobbyists who come to this institution, um, it, particularly um, they know, for, you know, I'll use GGM as an example. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a rock hound. And I know that they have specimens here of some mineral that I've never seen before. And I walk in the door, and the only thing I stop to do is ask the guard, where is the geology gem of the mineral? So I go straight there, and I don't go to the whole time. I go and find that specimen that I'm interested in seeing, because I, they, I know that you've got the best specimen here in the world of that mineral. And that's not anything like a facilitator or an explorer. And that would really be a very different kind of experience. So in that respect, these are all, you know, they, they are embarrassing. I've talked myself into believing that. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about children who don't usually get to decide mm -hmm. what I'm going to museum because yeah. they don't just want to decide, but they still do have needs. Yes. It's a great question. First, the question is, well, what about children? Do these categories fit for children? Uh, is the short version of that question. Um, and the short answer is, I'm not sure, but I think so. Um, all of this data today, all of my data, has been collected on adults. And the reason I have, there's a very simple explanation why I focus on adults. It's called higher bees. Um, and, um, trying to preserve the ecological validity of the situation. If, I, if I'm going to talk to kids, I have to actually get signed for release forms from their parents. If I want to talk to adults, if they agree to talk to me, that's all they need to do. And the IRB board is very happy with that distinction. So it's been a lot easier in short term to do all this preliminary research on adults. I have no reason to believe the kids are any different. I don't know whether these same five identities would be identical for kids. 
I know that there are institutions that are, um, and researchers that are committed and are serious about um, trying to do this research with children and find out what the case is. But just for example, I would say, you know, take your usual, um, it, even if we take out a school group, uh, family groups, take school group. Here's an interesting case. The assumption of the teacher, I'm bringing these kids, and the role that they're going to be in is a professional hobbyist, right? I'm assuming that they're here to act as professionals and to learn this stuff. I will tell you that most kids that I know in school field trips are not enacting a professional hobbyist <laughs> motivation. They're here because either they're experienced seekers or explorers, or if they're teens, they're facilitators. Um, and the last thing they want to worry about is being professional hobbies. And that tends to be a conflict in terms of their agenda and what they perceive in their needs are and what this adult authority figure is assuming their needs are. Yeah. website 
and um, it says, I like dot, dot, dot. And then there were literally dozens and dozens, maybe over 100 different things. I like mystery. I like family outings. I like romance. I like to explore. I like, and then just all these descriptors. And you pick the one that fit your interests. And lo and behold, they would tell you how you can satisfy that need at a selection of museums. So rather than say, OK, this week we have this exhibit on X, which is starting from the institution's perspective. They started from the visitor's perspective. So tell us what you're interested in, and we'll tell you how we can satisfy your curiosity at one of our institutions or multiple institutions. That sort of where I'm going with this is it's about saying, how can we tap into the interests and needs of our visitors and help them figure out then how those needs can be satisfied here or at one of our institutions. And um, in a parallel way, it's trying to understand then following up, how can we continue to satisfy those needs after you leave? So what is it that you got interested in that we can be supportive of in the weeks and months and years that go out from here? And I would say the key to all that is getting inside it outside of your own heads. It's not about you. It's about them. And you got to figure out something about who they are and what they're interested in and say, how can we be of value to them based on their needs and the way they define their needs and interests. Um, that's not something by and large museums are very good about doing. It's been all about us. And we will allow you to visit us. Let's take uh, one more. I think these questions can go on all day. I can certainly go on all day. Could have figured this out. 